Hello, my name is Charles Sparakis, and uh, I'm the host for Hana, who uh, is doing work sort of on his own, playing with robots and seeing how cheap he can make them. Uh, he's graduated from Stanford uh, a few years ago. We've been friends for a while now, and he's recently moved to uh, New Zealand, where he is happily uh, retired, I believe is the term, uh, after having started his own company and set it free. So uh, he's a pretty much a true engineer. He plays with hardware, he plays with software, and he plays with buildings. Uh, he's built his own wine cellar, he's built his own second floor, but he did it underneath his first floor. So without any further ado, I give you Hanno. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Google, for having me over here. Um, yes, I did move out to New Zealand about four years ago. Before that, I spent some time doing marketing stuff. But I did get a computer science degree from Stanford, so I am a true engineer, and I have been doing lots of hardware and software lately. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to share some of the things that I've been working on, some robots, some software, and some cool hardware that's coming out pretty soon um, to share that with you and um, people watching this video. So I, my motto is that I build sophisticated yet affordable robots. And one of the programs that I built is Viewport. And unlike a marketing person, I'm going to do lots of demos. So all we'll see today are demos. And um, I'll talk about my dance bot, um, which um, balances and is guided by vision. I'll talk about Viewport and how, that's, how that can be used to tune the dance bot and um, other embedded systems, other robots. I'll talk about the debugger that I built for debugging propeller code. And I'll steer a simulated dance bot with um, OpenCV. Um, that's a computer vision library. And I'll talk about the prop scope. All of this stuff runs on a parallax propeller. And Parallax is a company that's been around for a long time. Um, they've built basic stamps and bow bots that are used heavily in education and by hobbyists and robot, um, roboticists. And they've recently put out a very interesting processor um, that's ideal for building hobby projects, um, but are, is also being used in education and also being used in the industry to control um, relatively sophisticated um, projects. And it's an eight um, core processor. So there is eight processors running on one chip. They share one global memory. And they're 32-bit. They run at 80 megahertz. And the whole thing costs $8 in quantity one. And the nice thing about having multiple cogs is that you can split complicated items into their own separately running processor. They all share memory, so it's very easy to share data. But it's very easy to split your projects and debug them one at a time. You can use C, but the preferred language is called SPIN. It looks sort of like C. I'll show you what it looks like in a little bit. And you can also dive down very easily into Assembler. And that's fast enough to input and output video signals. And I'll show you some of that. So first demo that I'll show is the dance bot. And this was a project that I set up as a challenge to myself to build a balancing robot. And in the beginning, I spent quite a bit of time trying to come up with a low cost, um, yet very precise way of measuring tilt. So measuring which way the robot is leaning. Um, that's very important to know when you want to balance something. You need to know which way the robot is leaning. And there's quite a, quite a few different methods of doing that. One of them is to use um, light or sound to measure how far um, the, the distance to the floor. And another one is to use some sort of substance that changes, so mercury or something, to figure out how far it's leaning back and forth. The best method is to use a gyroscope, which tells you how quickly something is turning about an axis, and an accelerometer which tells you the direction of gravity. And so those two give you two different ways of measuring tilt. One of them is the exact tilt at a given time, and the other is the rate of turn about an axis. So you need some way of mathematically combining those two techniques, and I used a Kalman filter. It's a mathematical approach that combines those two signals, a signal and a derivative, 
to come up with a very accurate measurement of both. The accelerometer is very sensitive to gravity, but gravity is a very small force compared to um, being shaken back and forth in a moving object um, or being pushed. All those type of things are much, le much more than 1G. And the gyroscope is very good for measuring um, rate of turn, but integrating that alone um, is fine for a short period of time, but not for long periods of time. For long periods of time, that signal will change, will, will drift. So that's one sensor, and this picture in the um, upper corner here um, shows a servo where I'm tilting this platform that I built back and forth, and where I figured out how to optimize the Kalman filter and where I played with those sensors. Then I progressed to building up one of these and very carefully trying to keep it standing up. Favorite story I have about this is that my son was about a year old at this point. And so it was a race against time. Who was going to balance first, my son or my robot? And um, all day long, I would either play with my son or play with my robot, and with both, um, try to guide it to start off from a known good position and then to go from there. And um, they both sort of balance the same time. Um, he's much further along than I am right now. Um, he's three now. And then from there, I kept going and added vision, so I added a camera and added some vision processing and had lots of fun with it. So I took it to my daughter's kindergarten. Here's a picture of her taking daddy's robot to kindergarten, and I spent about half an hour answering all sorts of questions. Um, questions I get here today will probably be much more sophisticated, but it's amazing what kindergartners come up with for questions. And um, I think they're almost the same questions. The, vocabulary and jargon is a little bit differently. They might say, how long does it last before the battery goes out? Well, you might say, what's the battery consumption? What's the power flow? All these great things. Um, and being a marketing guy, I like to sort of talk about things and write things up. And so I've been pretty active in the hobby and robot community and write articles and have lots of fun with it. And recently, I had my robot balancing a glass of champagne, a, a flute of champagne, in an art exhibit in downtown Christchurch in New Zealand. And that was a good learning challenge for me and a lot of fun. A lot of new people exposed to robotics and computers and those type of things. So um, I like to do that sort of stuff. And so what this um, robot does is it has a camera. It has a quadrature encoder which tells it where it is. It has the gyroscope and accelerometer. I pre-process information um, to find out where a person is, position velocity, tilt, rate of turn. And then there's some logic that controls the behavior of a robot. And I use fuzzy logic um, to combine all these different inputs to eventually steer the wheels. The only thing the robot can do is steer the wheels and turn around and um, move backwards and forwards with that. A um, little bit more information. So the demo that I'll show, um, where I'll look at some signals that are produced by the dance bot. I'll look at those signals using what I call the viewport debugger. And it shows you all the information that's currently being processed by the processor. And then there is the processor itself. And that's the parallax propeller. And again, it has eight cogs. I'm making full use of it. Um, I have a software frame grabber that I wrote myself that takes an NTSC signal from a $9 black and white camera and processes that into memory. Then I have another cog that does image processing, very, very simple image processing. I don't have a lot of memory. I don't have a lot of processing power on the system itself. But I am able to find, for example, the brightest spot. I can also look for barcodes. And so with that, I can do some pretty interesting things. And the nice thing by having these eight cores is that I can focus on one project at a time. I can focus on one of these tasks at a time, get it working, and then combine it all by running it on this $8 chip. I have another cog that looks at the quadrature encoder and measures the position and the velocity of a robot. Another one that measures tilt using the accelerometer and the gyro. Another one that does this math processing that applies the Kalman filter to fuse those two inputs. 
a fuzzy logic um, cog that keeps running fuzzy logic code to control the robot, some pulls with modulation to drive the motors, and then a conduit cog where I continually send data um, for telemetry purposes over to the PC. And I'll show you what's coming over the wire. And then on the robot itself, there is a gyroscope, an accelerometer, encoder, camera, and the motors. So now let's go to an actual demo. So this is the software that I wrote. It's called Viewport. And it's a way for me to look into the propeller. So the propeller is running what I just told you about on seven of the eight cogs. And I have wrote some firmware that continually sends data from global memory over to my laptop. And now I can display it. And the way I like to debug things, um, the way I started debugging things, is to use um, simulated instruments, like an oscilloscope, a logic analyzer, spectrum analyzer, to look at my variables over time. So there is, so you can set breakpoints and step and so on to look at a program as it's executing. But when this guy falls over, I need to be able to see what happened in the past. I need to go backwards in time and sort of like a black box recorder on a plane, figure out why did it fall down? What happened five minutes ago? And what variables, how did they change over time? How did we get to the state right now, which I'd like to fix. So it's running right now, and these are the actual outputs of the sensors that are coming to the propeller. The top one over here is the SPI data coming from the accelerometer chip. It's a very cheap, small little chip that tells me where gravity is, is pulling this from. And it's a simple protocol where you send it some bits. So we're really at the hardware level. We're not talking operating system. We're not talking about threads. We're actually talking about sending a couple bits over the wire and then getting a couple bits back. And this is, a, this is an actual pin that I can look at on, on this processor. And the last byte over here um, tells me the quantity of acceleration. Um, and that tells me where gravity is pulling. So that tells me where, where it's being pulled down. This next one over here is the gyroscope. And that's a normal hobby gyroscope. So there's many $500 sensors out there that give you this sort of information. But this is a um, $10, $20 solution to, for the same problem. And I send it a pulse. And what comes back in purple here is a, um, another pulse and you'll notice that as I'm tilting the robot back and forth, the length of that pulse changes. So if I'm turning up one way, it's smaller. If I'm turning it the other way, it's longer. And we also have another one um, I'll trigger on this bottom one here. This is a um, quadrature encoder. And um, the quadrature encoder it is just like your mouse on your desktop, so a traditional mechanical mouse with a ball. And with that one, the number of pulses tells me how quickly I'm rotating the wheel. And the phase of the pulses tells me the direction that the wheel is traveling. So with all that information, I can figure out wh where the robot is at any given time. I also have a camera on here. And um, it's just a little black and white camera, so it's not very good. And um, let's see if I can find someone there. So it's a little black and white camera, and there's a person there. And um, here's my hand. Let's see, there are my fingers. And um, the signal to this camera here is going from this NTC camera to an analog digital converter to the chip, the processor, where I'm where I wrote some code to sample that continuously, look for the horizontal vertical sinks, and then write that into memory, and then do some simple vision processing on it. So what I can do is I can um, take my laser pointer, and um, what I'm graphing on the top now is the position of a brightest spot. And so if I find my laser there, um, 
you'll notice now the blue and red lines are relatively steady. And now when I draw a circle, um, they're making sine waves that are shifted by 90 degrees. So it's finding the position of my bright spot, and that's what I could use to drive a robot around. Um, let's go back into this and look a little bit more into viewport. So viewport is this tool that I initially wrote so that I could debug my own robot. But um, over time, more and more people became interested in it. And so now this is my full-time job. I'm, I'm building and I'm selling this, uh, this tool. It's a debugging tool, but it's, it's a very fancy debugging tool. Um, I showed you the logic state analyzer. It has a spectrum analyzer. It has a, um, th those type of simulated in instruments. But it also lets you monitor and change variables over time. So your program is running, and in real time, um, you can just go behind the scenes and change the variable um, value. So if you want to change some control logic, you can ch change that behind the scenes. It has some fuzzy logic visualization built in. It has some computer vision built in with OpenCV that I'll show. And um, I'm, I'll also show here a simulated physics package that's included that um, lets you simulate how a robot would go in the real world but do it in a simulated environment, accelerated by your graphics card so that you can simulate very complex um, physics simulations. This is the architecture viewport. Um, on the left side here is the propeller, the shared memory, um, and input and output over 32 I.O. pins. And then your program running in seven of those cogs. And viewport shares all that data with the PC using one additional cog. And then there is this USB wire that it streams the data over both ways, full duplex at two megabits per second. And then inside a viewport, you have customizable views. So you can add widgets, you can drag and drop them, sort of Visual Studio-like. You have um, these big analog, easy to use um, controls. And you can view some data, minimums, maximums, and you can change data by using Windows controls like scroll bars and buttons and all that good stuff. Um, let me show you um, a little bit more in viewport. So here is the fuzzy logic screen. And um, what, what I can do with fuzzy logic is um, take variables, the, the value of a variable, and using fuzzy logic, I can fuzzify that into one of five classes and then act on that as if it's just in that class. So I can write much easier logic. I can say, if the robot is leaning far forward and it's going too fast, then you need to do this, as opposed to doing everything at the PID level, at the, um, at the value level. And um, so Viewport also has a terminal built in where you can send data back and forth um, the old way, where you print the strings and input strings. Um, I showed you the fuzzy logic. Um, there's an analog mode where it has a spectrum analyzer and XY mode. And it also has, this is what we'll get to now, a code view where you can look at the code that's running on the processor. So here is some code. And let's um, look at a program. So here is a little program. Oh, actually, we'll look. So we'll look at this program. So here is a program that's written in this language called spin. And you declare some variables. Um, there's longs and bytes and um, also floating point, and some simple constructs like ifs and loops that you do with repeat. And when I started with this, there was just a compiler for the propeller, and so I like debuggers, so I wrote a debugger for this, and I'll show you how that works. So you click the start button to start debugging. This is now running on the propeller, but I can control the debugging from this environment that I have here. So if I want to pause this, I just hit the pause button, and it pauses in this line that it was just executing. And I can step through this code, so 
or is stepping, and then I can step over and um, step out of routines. I can set a breakpoint, so it ran all the way to there. And um, all the good stuff with the debugger, so it shows you variables, and I can change them in here. But it also has fun things like it transfers all of memory over, so I can look at the complete memory space of a processor. I have a watch list where I can look at variables. And um, I also have a call stack, as well as a profiler, so I can see how much time is spent in each, each of the functions. So fun project that now all the people that are using the propeller can apply this to and um, can make a little bit more progress with their projects. Um, back to the presentation. So another demo um, is using OpenCV and physics. Um, OpenCV has been a project for about 10 years. It was initially started by Intel um, to get people to use more of their Pentiums and to buy more powerful chips to do computer vision with their processors. And for a long time, people, researchers, um, scientists, professors have been writing their own packages to do vision processing. And this was a open source um, way of combining that skill. And for a while, it was at Intel. And now it's at Willow Garage, um, funded by one of the Google founders. And OpenCV does lots of interesting things. So it lets you use your standard web camera. And then it applies all the known algorithms to that. So there is an algorithm to find colored blobs. There's an algorithm to find faces. There's an algorithm to find circles and squares and polygons and triangles and anything in between. So it's similar to what we have in our brain, where there's lots of different areas that find different things for us. And with OpenCV, these, it's all open, and you can keep changing it as you want. So what I'll show you is a simulated dance bot that's running, um, that's being controlled by code on the propeller. So I still write my controlling code for the propeller. I use the same spin code that I would use later on on my robot. But what I'll do is I'll simulate this in an environment where all the physics are simulated to good, very good accuracy. So it simulates gravity, it, it simulates um, friction, um, it simulates um, all sorts of joints out there. And with today's graphics cards, you can actually accelerate this physics simulator with your graphics card. So you can ex um, simulate millions of small particles that are acting like water particles or snow and see how your robot would perform on driving on snow surfaces or those type of things. And what I'll do in this demo is I'll have viewport be the centerpiece, so the glue, for three different processors. I'll use the propeller to control the robot. I'll use the graphics card to do the physics simulation. And I'll use my processor, my, my main CPU on the laptop, to, simu to do the face detection algorithm with OpenCV to steer the robot. So let's start that. And I'll just go back in here. This is viewport again. And inside of viewport, I'll pick up this physics program. And I'll run it. Run it sends it to the um, processor. And um, we'll go into the video screen. So this is, okay. so here I am. Um, this is the camera that's built into my laptop. And it's finding, it, it, it's showing a picture of where I am, here I am. And the face detection algorithm is finding my face. So it's drawing a red rectangle around my face. And when I move back and forth, it keeps finding where my face is. And the location of that face is used to steer this, visual, this simulated robot. So I'll bring open this pane here. And this is a simulated world. So it's this nice 3D world, which has some sort of floor, some sort of texture there. It has. Um, little mountaintops and so on. 
And in this world, I can um, reset this very easily, so I don't break things. In the real world, my robot breaks all the time, and I have to solder it together and fix it. In the simulator world, um, I hit the key, and everything gets reset to the initial status. And I can also apply forces to it, um, so I can tip it over if I wanted to, and those type of things. But what I'll do is just move my head, and by moving my head, it turns one way. Or if I move my head on other parts, it moves another way. So there's lots of complexity. Engineers like complexity, so I try to make it very fun for you guys. Um, but what's going on behind the scenes is that this simulated dance spot there is actually being controlled by the parallax propeller. And there's lights blinking here all the time that are sending the data from the simulated world back into the propeller, and then it figures out what to do, and it sends the instructions to turn the wheels back and forth over here. So that's that. And now let's go back to this. So lastly, um, I'll talk about a um, project I'm very excited about, which is called a prop scope. And this is um, what it looks like right now. There's a nice glossy picture of it um, out there. And it's a very general purpose, multifunction, USB-powered oscilloscope function generator logic analyzer that will be sold in retail stores like Fry's and Radio Shack for under $200. Um, so a lot of engineers, a lot of um, students and so on go to school and then they go home and would really like to have a oscilloscope, a function generator, all those things back at home. But um, it's, it's relatively expensive to set up a lab like that and it takes a lot of space. And they're also relatively complex. And so um, working with Parallax, I'm doing the software, they're doing the hardware, and we're building this um, device that combines all those functionalities in one simple box. And it's powered by the same library that I wrote for Viewport, um, but it's applied to this very simple multifunction oscilloscope. So that is it. Any questions? All right, so you demoed everything under uh, Windows. What about Mac and uh, Linux support? Uh, Mac and Linux support for Viewport. So I, um, I think I wrote all this sort of stuff in about 10 different languages. So there's a spin, there is a assembly, there is a C++ for the open TV, there is a C++ for the um, physics integration. But the main part is all written in .NET. And .NET, there is a project called Mono.NET. That lets you that gives it support to Solar, um, Solaris, Linux, OS X to run natively on there. These days, there is support. There's emulation support um, for um, running Windows code on lots of other platforms, and Viewport has been running in that type of mode for the last couple of years. Um, so it is possible to run it in emulation, but um, down the road there is at least a pathway for me to run this under mono.net, um, both viewport and the prop scope itself. And the prop scope itself, um, the communication protocol will be published and open so that people, if they want to use it as a hardware and with the firmware running, they can build their own tools and do other uses as well for it. How much memory do I have? Um, right now it's running on three processors, so there is <laughs> memory distributed everywhere. But on the Parallax propeller, there is eight processors, and each one of those has two kilobytes of RAM dedicated to itself. And all eight share a further 32 kilobytes of RAM. So compared to our desktops, where we have gigabytes and so on, um, there is very little memory to play with on here. But as you saw, there's still some room to do very simple vision processing and um, some room to do pretty sophisticated stuff. So, 
so you're doing some stuff where you're talking to servo style things. Just how much I/O capability is there? The question was how much I/O capability is there in the chip? Um, the chip is designed to be very general purpose. So each of the eight cogs is exactly like every other one, and there are 32 I/O pins. And each one of those is completely general purpose. There is no I/O pin dedicated to video. There's no I/O pin dedicated to um, RS-232. Each one of those is just an I/O pin that can be set to either be a output or an input. And if it's an output, you can um, very easily through the code turn it on and off. So you're programming watch the code and everything in software. Yeah. So everything that you've seen is through software. Um, the connection that sends data from the propeller to here is an RS-232 connection, and that's bit banged. So bit banging means that you are um, outputting a one for a certain amount of time, and then outputting a zero. And the nice thing about the propeller is that there are no interrupts. So with a standard chip, you have interrupts um, because you're only running on one processor. And so you're running for a while, and then you get interrupted, and then um, the operating system takes some time away for you to update the mouse, and then you do your program for a while and update something else. Um, there's no operating system. There's nothing interrupting you. So over here, you're running on a processor on a cog. And if, at least in assembly language, um, each instruction takes exactly this much time. So 80 megahertz, 12 and a half nanoseconds, so per, and four cycles per instruction, so it takes 50 nanoseconds per instruction. And so if you want to output a pulse that's 200 nanoseconds long, then you have to have this many instructions in between there. And that lets you relatively easily come up with a way of inputting video or counting um, quadrature and quarter pulses or all the rest. So very general purpose, 32 pins that you can allocate. I'm actually using, um, I, I think, basically all the 32 I/O pins. There's a couple for the serial communication. There's a couple for the quadrature encoder. There's a couple for the um, H bridges. There's a couple for um, accelerometer and camera. So it adds up, but um, it worked out. question was about the physics engine, how good it is, is it? I just started playing with it. Um, but it's been around for a couple years. There is one that's open source, ODE. And there's another one that I use, PhysX, um, that was bought up by NVIDIA. Right now, in games, all the physics is, most of the physics is approximated, right? If you, if you shoot a gun and a bullet travels, nothing is simulated there. It's just sort of cast away and figures out that the person is shot, and then the person blows up and dies. Um, and what the gaming companies are hoping will happen is that uh, physics will actually be simulated, and that if you um, shoot a person, then it's a ragdoll, and everything has mass and inertia, and there's joints, and um, the joint only goes as far, and that's when it falls apart. Um, things like gravel and grass. Um, get pretty complicated because what you have to do there is simulate every single part. For example, driving on grass, there's nothing simple about it. What you have to simulate is every um, blade of grass is a, um, is a bunch of rods that, and rods um, don't bend or anything, and in between the rods are joints, and the joints have a certain stiffness and uh, Damp, um, damping factor and all those separate things, and there's a little bit of inertia. And in order to do a square meter of grass, you should count how many blades you need, but that's how much processing power you need. And that's why it's nice that you can run this either in simulation, where you can run very simple things, or um, accelerate it by your graphics card. And NVIDIA um, has made it so that if you have an NVIDIA graphics card, then you just 
run the software and it detects that there is a graphics card that can be accelerated and everything's accelerated by CUDA. And so it is possible to simulate your, your robot running on grass with some gravel. And then the gravel is um, a, a rock, which has some sharp corners, maybe not. But all, all that's coming. So um, certainly NVIDIA is hoping that um, that's the future of gaming. And that when you play a game soon, you um, do everything with simulated things like that. Water, you have to simulate every water particle, right? And figure out how it's interacting with others and go from there. I'm using a whole bunch of Google technologies, so um, custom search for my website to have people find stuff, Gmail, of course, Picasa. Um, I use Google Checkout, um, which is wonderful. I get an email in the morning that tells me how many people have bought my software, and it goes directly into my bank account. Very easy. I have Google Analytics, which tells me where people are coming from. Um, yeah, so lots of Google stuff. Big fan. I'm, I think I'm the best um, Picasso salesperson out here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.